Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of A Contagious Smile Unstoppable. This is going to be a show I have longed for and I'm very, very honored to have Ed Cronin come back with us. He's been with us before. He is a favorite of mine and I'm going to let him introduce himself and his colleague, which we are super excited to have. Thank you both for being here today. Thank you. Uh, first, I'm Ed Cronin, and I've had over 35 years in law enforcement on a lot of different levels. I was a police chief in a couple of cities in Massachusetts, and I've done extensive work uh, as a police advisor, especially in countries in Eastern Europe. And the last three years I spent as a senior police advisor working to transform the police in Moldova from an old Soviet style of corruption to a more modern policing. And while doing it, I had the wonderful opportunity to work with my colleague who's here. Her name is Ulrika Gramberg, and I'd let her introduce herself. Thank you, Ed. Thank you for having me here. Well, I'm on a visit and I'm visiting friends, Ed, since we are friends since I think it's four years now, isn't mm -hmm. it? Uh, I am um, a police officer as well. Uh, I've served in the Swedish Police Authority uh, for uh, 31 years. So, and uh, during my years within the Swedish Police Service, uh, I've been in uh, in patrol units. Uh, I've been in juvenile crime units, uh, criminal investigation, and right now I'm heading the border police section in the mid part of Sweden. Wow. I also worked abroad a lot. I worked with the uh, democratic um, development and also police reform. Uh, and as Ed, uh, I've been in the Eastern Europe. Uh, I was also working in Serbia uh, and uh, also in Africa, in Sudan. Wow. But then I met Ed uh, in 2017, I think it was, in Moldova. Mm -hmm. I was also working on police reform uh, at that time. Wow. I'm so honored to have you. Thank you for joining us on your vacation. Thank you so much. Well, we were going to discuss today about here in the United States, our crime is just going crazy through the roof where you have people that go to a parade and they don't go home to their family that night. We've had the the Boston Marathon. You, you name a plethora of criminal activity that's going on, school shootings, whatever the case may be. I mean, we've had 257 school shootings just this calendar year alone and people are getting too afraid i i have a show called a contagious smiles teen talk and i had some amazing teenagers come on and they said that the thing they fear most about going back to school is coming home like they were afraid they were going to get shot and i can't imagine my child who is a teenager going through that because in our grade in our age back then the only thing we had to worry about is dodgeball and getting home before the street lights were on. Like that was, that was it. You know, we didn't ever worry about this stuff. And what I would love to have, especially with your incredible resume is your perspective on what can the United States do to, or what do we need to do? Because something we aren't doing is making it so unsafe to even go out on the streets, daylight, nighttime, doesn't matter. 24 hours a day, it's unsafe. And we've got to see what we can do in order to calm this down and make our streets safer, even more importantly for our kids. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm very sad to hear uh, all uh, the incidents here in, in this country, but I'm also sad to, uh, my, my reflection, reflection is that uh, I think it looks similar in many countries right now. Uh, it's like an uh, epidemic uh that is going on um uh, and the causes of it I, i'm i cannot say because i'm not uh, into to those issues but i th or questions but i think that one thing is that we we now more think just of ourselves we are more individuals than actually a group or families or societies so i think that since very very much me me myself and i uh, kind of mentality, uh, this can grow. The, the, that is one thing. But I also think that it's also um, a lack of uh, responsibility. Uh, people don't take, res they are not responsible for what they do. I mean, if, for example, um, 
uh, if you have kids, I, I, I don't want to blame uh, families, but if you have kids, you must also be able to take care of them. Yes. And if you can't take care of your kids, you know, to bring them up to decent citizens, then you should ask for help. Yes. Uh, but since it is this me, myself and I mentality, I think that everybody just want to mind their own business. That is just my reflection on, on, on this right now, I think. And what do you think, Mr. Ed? Uh, I think that's a that's a pretty big question. Uh, <laughs> one of the uh, great opportunities I've had is to work in other countries. And I even had the opportunity to spend some time in Sweden. And uh, one of the things that is stark, mm -hmm. we used this word the other day, mm -hmm. is the availability of guns in this country. Mm -hmm um for over 400 million last count yes um Crazy. and that mixed with the culture of the frontier culture of this country where guns can be used to settle issues uh right. it becomes a very quick go-to um i was telling my friend here that uh my wife and i were in dallas uh, about three weeks ago at a police convention and we were walking outside and there was a young kid, probably 18 years old on a skateboard, packing a gun with his holster. Free carry. Really? Yeah. No license, nothing. Okay. So, uh, you know, if, if it's that available and if people would want to keep upping the game. Right. Then I think I'm not surprised where we're, where we're at. What do you guys think we could do in order to get these crimes under control? I, I know they're not going to all stop, but I mean, what can we do to provide better protection and safety for our kids, for our, our families? Well, uh, jurisdiction. I, well, I'm, there might be a lot of people here that does, uh, does not agree with me, but I mean, it's, uh, it, it must be, it must you must be what can I say apply for a license uh, for 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 having a gun. I mean this the, the gun laws that you have here uh, it's very what can I say different <laughs> from other countries. Right, uh, being nice. Yeah, yeah. Actually, <laughs> uh, I, mean, I got mine and I went through and got my permit. Yeah, and, and then also all those because mainly I don't know how it is here but back home mainly there are young men that are actually angry angry young men that are actually are doing this these type of crimes and I think there we also have something to work with uh, mm -hmm. to work on uh, how how to get these young men be in one part of the of the society with the, you know knowing their what they have to do and also be involved in the society you know with work uh, be responsible citizens uh, but without work, uh, without any future, uh, without uh, being uh, a part of the of the whole society with everything in it, and and then angry, uh, frustrated, and then it's easy to get a gun. Right. Then you can solve the problem just by, and it's very easy. And and suddenly there won't be even a problem to solve. You just do it anyway because you get angry. So I think. Uh, yeah, we have to work on the uh, these young frustrated men, and to work with them. And right. Their families. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Do you have an input on this one? Um, I think you know all these things have become so politically polarized that um, we've lost sight of the forest through the trees. Okay, and I would just give a. You know, this is something I've said a million times and I wrote about it in my book. Um, if you look at how many police officers are shot and killed in the United Kingdom versus the United States, if you look at how many murders are committed, I mean, it's it's black and white and they don't have the gun proliferation violence that we have. They have some mm -hmm. uh, and the police don't even wear firearms. So it's not part of their culture, okay? Um, and I think, you know, instead of being polarized about a right, this right, you know, step it up, push it back, we need to have real intelligent, raw data that shows what works. And when I look at the data and I see this horrible situation in the U.S. 
and I see this horrible situation in Britain, what's the comp? What's what's the difference? Uh-huh. If you take guns out of the equation, mm. you know, and I'm all for firearms and, you know, to a certain extent uh, in our country, but I think it's gotten way out of control. You know, right now people are talking about, well, let's put guns on all the teachers. I think that's a horrible idea. Well, you know what they're going to do? They're going to come in with, you know, fully loaded machine guns. They'll outgun yeah. them. Yeah. And then they're going to say the uh, the teacher's got to have AR-16s. Yeah. You it's know, just like, it just keeps escalating. Yeah. Right. And then so some students could overpower some of these teachers, too, in the classroom. And then you have a containment right there. You know, there's devices out there that will ensure that those doors can't be open from the outside. But our school systems are, can't even pay for those for the teachers and the safety of our own students. I mean, that's that's ludicrous. I just I can't fathom, you know, I'm wrapping my head around that. These are our kids. Right. But, you know, building on what Ulrika said, too, you know, why? Right. You know, why are these kids angry? Mm. You know, and I'm a systems thinker. I wrote about that in my book. Yes. Which and, you have to go out and get. It's a great book. Why do yeah. you think that they're so angry? Me? Um, I don't have firsthand knowledge, but if I had to guess, I think people uh, become angry and violent when they have the perception that they can't participate mm -hmm. or they're left out somehow. Whether or not it's legitimate or not, um, it's real to them. Right. You know, so I think the way we go about our society in this country, we have do a lot of great things, but we have a winner take all attitude in our system. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that's if you so lose, true. You're a loser. Mm, right. Okay. And even when I go to other countries in Europe, like Sweden, it's not that way. You know, they're not perfect. They have bad people like everybody else, but the system is not built for, you know, if you fail, then you're on the outskirts. You, you know, you're not part of it anymore. You're, you're outcast. Mm hmm. Do you believe that these violent video games that these kids are, are playing for 8, 10, 12 hours a day have any influence on it? I don't think so. I don't think so, to be honest. I think that that is just a small, small, small maybe in, uh, maybe trigger for somebody that is really, that is just going to go there, you know, like somebody that's al already uh, frustrated and angry and then maybe just because of something maybe a video game it could just fall over and and that was the, the trigger but i don't think video games actually when we see kids uh, um, back home uh, they don't play video games i mean they because they cannot sit still they cannot be on same spot for hours because they have so much in their body that must to you know come out so right. they sit still and do the video games i think that main most people or most kids that do video games whatever the games they do actually they're quite nice i mean because they get everything out there on the screen but, but these the ones that we talk about those who actually um go out and, and harm or or actually do something terrible to other people they are not video game the games persons per se i mean of course some could have but they could also have you know played soccer or ice hockey or whatever uh, right. so uh, i think it's just uh, yeah if you have something to do and if you're good at something video games sports music or whatever then you don't go out and, and do harm right it's when you have nothing it's when you are when you are nothing you know that's right. well, well yeah. put yeah Fair then enough. you go out so we need to find something else that actually take you know uh, that that um, that they can go into go in and, and use their energy in uh, so um, i think that maybe some of the listeners now they might you know uh, google sweden and swedish police and so on and we also have problems we also have these kind of shootings we are not of course, in the same place as U.S. Right. Because with less population and we don't have these the, these uh, gun laws and so on. But we have guns and we have shootings and far more than we actually should have. Uh, but we also find out that uh, they really need something to do. They need to work or go to school. I mean, manage school. Uh, many of these, they just drop off from school uh, and they and 
also most of them actually are uh, first or second generation immigrants and they don't speak the language and you know to be frustrated you don't belong there right you don't see yourself as a swede uh, you don't know the language properly your parents have never gone to work because they don't even know the language either they drop off school they don't have they are not good in sports or music or whatever they are nothing and then of course they are frustrated and angry so we need to have something instead of going out you know doing those bad things mm -hmm. right uh, what is domestic violence like in your country because in the united states it's one in every four women and one in every three if they're law enforcement or military and mine was military my ex was military and ed and i had a pretty in-depth conversation about it and i already respected him before i had him on the show but my respect for him just skyrocketed yeah. when we talked more and more about it because when mine happened, I kept going to my command and not, so, well, sorry, not my command, his command and kept saying, this is, this is continuing. This is continuing. Help me. And they literally turned a blind eye. They did not help me. They were protecting him. And mm -hmm. they said, why do you have all this evidence? Because he's still doing it. He broke my nose on the base and they did nothing. And it was like, what do people do? I remember asking Ed, what do people do if say an officer under your command you find out their spouse is being abused and nobody is doing anything. The, the sergeant, the watch commander, whoever is not helping. What do you do? I mean, and, and his answer just gave me hope because not many people care anymore. They cover for the abuser and not protect the victim. You know, it's supposed to be innocent until proven guilty. And now all the burdens on us, we have to prove that we were attacked. We have to prove that he did it or why did we make him mad or why did we stay or you know ridiculous questions the point is is that nobody should put their hands on you in an unwarranted manner so what is domestic violence like in, in over in sweden i cannot say that it's very common but it, of course it exists and sure. it exists in you know on all levels in society uh, and actually, to be honest, this is a uh, problem for the democracy. I mean, uh, growing up in a family where where you're not safe and secure, uh, you may not may you may not you know be the best person. Right. Uh, and then also, kids that grow up in this environment, seeing their mothers, you know, getting hit, and so they might be. Of course, they will be. It it will traumatize them of course of course uh, and it's a democratic problem so and we actually i think we we put the spotlight very much on this right now i mean the last five seven years it's really highlighted in everything we do uh, we put a lot of money in it both for the social service and also the help organizations but so mainly the police and and the uh, pro uh, prosecutor's office we really are trained uh and we really are uh I mean, there should be zero tolerance. Yes. Uh, yeah. And we really put some effort in and money. But but there is also, you should understand that it's it's also it's 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 also um what can I say? Uh you're pushing the the old norms, you know, like the old old style of doing things, and it takes time to change that. Uh, the perception and so on on how to perform, for example, police work, and also the perception on how uh, how the police um, uh, meet the needs of a, of a victim. Right. Uh, so the victims might be, as mm -hmm. as you say, they they might not even go to the to the police because they feel it is told. I mean, they won't bother. But now right. we do. So now they actually our uh, domestic violence crimes uh, cases they uh, in increase is it when it goes up yeah mm -hmm. the race because we are more open to to take on those cases mm -hmm. uh, and we also work with with preventive measures being out in schools and so on because you really need to talk to the kids when they are young to be good boys and, and break the be, cycle yes right. so that 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 the boys will be raised being nice mm -hmm. to 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 others i mean right. it's not only females that are actually mm -hmm. exposed to domestic violence there's also other, other boys so, so but but uh, we really put the uh, the sh sharp headlight on this, so it's it's up on the agenda every day. So what happens here in the United States if, say for instance, I call the police and I'm in the middle of a domestic? I understand that is the most dangerous call for an officer to respond to. My husband now is, is former uh, law enforcement as well, and former military, and so they respond. But if they don't physically see 
the acts transpiring, there's nothing that they can do. That's what happens here. And so they don't do anything. They, they, you know, we didn't see it. You know, they, they come in, they take one party, one place, the other officer takes the other party. Then they switch, they get each other's stories, you know, a paper cut of a, let's get a restraining art is really just going to piss off the, the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. And then the statistics within like it's around six to eight percent of the abusers are actually serving any time incarcerated for being abusive period in a domestic violence capacity now the females who do self-defense in order to protect themselves and their children there's a 42 percent rate of incarceration for them for protecting themselves so Mm -hmm. i can't understand why what are we supposed to do like literally just lay there and let them beat us half to death because i i just don't understand what what are we supposed to do because we can't do that and we can't let our kids see that either so what what do you do well in massachusetts just speaking from my state and i think it's pretty common in most states um police can arrest on probable cause all right and what that means is there's more likely that it happens and there's a there's evidence. So in mm-hmm. other words, if I went I have to have marks house, on my person. Yeah. If I went to your house and uh, well, I won't use you, but if I went to a woman's mm-hmm. house and she complained that she was slapped by her husband, there are all kinds of measures I can use yes. in terms of uh, determining whether the assault took place. Her simple statement to me, mm-hmm. if it's, you know, if I hear it and I hear the ring of truth to it, Right. That's enough for me. Mm. Okay. I don't even have to see a mark. All right. And even in our state, if you threaten somebody, if you say, you know, I'm going to kill you, that's arrestable. Right. And if it's heard by another person, it's a terroristic threat. Well, I, I don't know. It's not like that with the state where I am, but we have a very comprehensive law and we not only have the police give the the ability of it. We also have, this is a very unique law in that as long as the police acted in good faith, they cannot be mm-hmm. sued. So, and not other crimes don't have that in it. Right. So that's how important uh, it is seen, at least in, you know, in the, in the places where I have worked. Right. You Why can't to... we, I'm sorry, go ahead. Is this similar for us? We have the similar regulation. And also now, since I think five years back, we have to also, every time we come to a domestic violence case, we need to tape, you know, on videotape. We have these body cams. So every step we take into the the home or whatever we are, and everything that the the female, mainly females, uh, what she's saying is taped and recorded. Mm -hmm. And that even though she... Uh, later, you know, take her, her her story back and said, oh, I don't want to, ch-, you know, um, I don't want you to take this case uh, further on. Then we said, OK, I'm sorry, but you are on tape and we will continue anyway, because it's for the best for the uh, we have this regulation called best for the state, what's uh-huh. best for everybody. Mm-hmm. And uh, and then we also know, uh, you know, that that she will be beaten next another time so that's why we go with the tape so Mm -hmm. and that is that is uh we need to we have to do that so yeah what do you guys think i'm sorry go ahead no i was just saying um unfortunately what happens many times when there is a an assault Mm -hmm. that takes place um i can think of one particular uh, assault that i knew from a person who was a police officer who uh, basically raped a woman. And um, the woman ended up making a complaint and uh, the police officer was put on suspension to further notice. And what commonly happens, not common, well, it can be commonly, but what happens many, many times is a woman will decide to drop the charges. Mm, right. And Out that- fear of retribution, right. And- Whatever the fear is. And that's the thing that I've learned through all my experience in career. There's a million reasons why they drop it. You know, it could be she loves him. It could be uh, the children. It could be they don't have anywhere else to go. It could be there's a million, you know, I I, I used to hear this one about, well, maybe she loves him. And I was like, wait, that can't be love, you know, but she thinks it is at that particular point. She's involved in this relationship. So, I've learned as a police officer, you have to respect that. Mm-hmm. 
you know, if she's not ready, she's not ready. But the downside of that, and I don't bring it anything back to the victim with this, it has nothing to do with the victim, is now I've got a bad police officer who can go forward and has no consequences. Right. That's the stuff that scares me. So then you what know? do you do as someone who held a position of chief when you find out one of your officers were accused of this? You can't do anything about it. Especially in our state. Our state uh, is the only state in the union. The the, un the the police unions are very powerful, okay? Mm -hmm. And in almost any other state, if in every other state, if there's a sexual assault reported against an officer, that becomes public. Not the person's name, but the issue, okay? okay. Uh -huh. So it's further noticed. But in our state, we don't even do that. Mm -hmm. So people are not even aware that it even happened. Yeah. What do you guys think of doing like, I mean, I think that we should do something like a registry. You have sex registers, you know, why can't we do one for domestic violence? So, you know, you can go online and, and Google are your neighbors, you know, sex offenders. Why can't we do one that have been found guilty of domestic violence so that people well, are you, aware? You can. you can for any crime. So in other words, if I go to a house and I meet John Doe and he just beat up his wife, I'll check his record. Right. I'm talking about a civilian. Why can't we make them be on a registry for domestic violence? You know, I think that that would be something that would help so many people. Yeah. In, yes, I can see the I can see the point. But also the other way uh, that could also trigger other people to to actually uh, because I mean, if they have been charged, and also if they had, you know, served their uh, their uh, time, yeah, their time, then right. they are, you know, like uh, it's down to zero. Uh, but if you if you actually sh you put them on on a board somewhere or whatever, uh, then it could actually, I mean, others could actually go after them and you know. Um, uh, you know, kill them or, or hurt them very much. And I, I, I don't want to encourage that. Sure. But I mean, I, child I, pedophiles are registered, you know, I mean, same, you, you've got yeah. people who are domestic violent survivors and they're mm -hmm. beating their wife and their kids, you know, and it doesn't have to say the victim. You like Ed just said, you know, you could say John Doe convicted of, you know, four counts of whatever adult, you know, minor, not saying the victim's names of, in any way for, safety of the you know community i see what you're saying uh, you know that's yeah i mean myself personally i i wouldn't have a problem with it i mean we're trying to find ways to make it safer for our kids and safer you know to be able to go out and enjoy life and you can't even go to a parade you can't run in a marathon without the the fear now we have kids that are like i'm afraid to go to school because am i going to come home yeah i think it actually uh uh I'm not. I, I'm from another country, and I don't really like to expose people like that. But but I mm -hmm. rather like to work with these people. I mean, put them in some kind of uh, uh, rehabilitation center, force them to you know like to undergo this rehabilitation until they actually know what they have done. Uh, I think. I mean, when it comes to a domestic violence case, for example, we now have we didn't have it before, but now we can actually. Um, uh, uh, not what was it? Give no. You you actually uh, let both the victim and the perpetrator to undergo some kind of rehabilitation together. So no, not together. Separate, okay. of course. So because they have different needs, because right. I think both need that. The the woman uh, main, mainly she she needs to understand what she has been uh, you know exposed for and what 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 he had done to her and and that that is not okay and so on so she will have some kind of self confidence to continue with her life finding may maybe another man to live with that is not the same uh, right. type of person uh, and and then the guy and the man needs to also to be in some kind of rehabilitation so he knows that what he had done and also to understand that this is you know the emp empathy and to find uh, to also to learn how to handle conflicts and so on. Uh, and then they, ha he has to, to do it as long as it's needed. Right. I think we, mm -hmm. But it costs money, of course. And I think when it comes to this, it's money also in mm -hmm. this. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of uh, 
energy. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very interested in your perspective about a certain thing. And I don't know, Ed, if you've heard this, it was, it was it, quite an uproar a couple of years ago that in Alabama, that um, convicted child molesters were getting chemically castrated. Mm -hmm. And people were up in arms about this. And people were saying, you're taking away the right to have kids. And mm -hmm. so many people said, who gives them a right to have kids after what they've done? Mm -hmm. What What is your feel and, and take on, on that? Well, I think it goes back to uh, my own personal beliefs about things like even the death penalty. Uh, right. I'm not a believer in um, any type of physical or punitive punishment. And I would see, you know, some type of castration as being something like that. And again, I don't, I've learned, I think, over the years that I understand why people feel that way. You know, they right. get very, very frustrated. Um, but I think like my colleague Ulrika is saying, you know, there's something else going mm -hmm. on there. Mm -hmm. That if you don't deal with what's causing these issues, then it's just going to come out in another way. All right. And it's hard, hard, hard work right. to do that. And sometimes as Americans, we don't like to do hard work. We like to get results. The easy way. Quick, quick. Um, but when that happens, then you have what's called unintended consequences. And that leads to other things, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, so what happens when they do it to the guy that was innocent? Mm. Right. You know what I mean? I mean, how do you even begin to even mm -hmm. address that you know i uh and believe me i don't speak this way out of any empathy mm -hmm. for people that commit crimes i have been working in different areas and different fields and different places around the world and i've seen things that uh don't work uh -huh. and uh, i don't think something like that is the answer right mm -hmm. And we actually have our ugly history uh, in Sweden. We actually castrated uh, people with uh, in the 50s, I think, 40s, uh, 40s and the 50s. We castrated those who were disabled, you know, uh, that that wasn't, what can I say? They were a little bit, uh, uh, well, they, they were not 100%. Right. Uh, I mean, right. they... Uh, so so to prevent them from having kids because they thought in those days that it will actually be inherited so the kid will also be a little bit you know stupid <laughs> uh we castrated i mean this the swedish government they castrated wow. and this is actually our really ugly history and i wouldn't because some of them weren't they were just a little slow and and they were you know normal people in other other, other ways uh, and i think that we shouldn't do that again we must work with other things because I think there is, I mean, of course, some people are really, really sick. Absolutely. Uh, they shouldn't be let out, but then keep them locked in then. Right. Uh, but, you know, to uh, to start to manipulate the bodies and so on, on on people that you actually, I think that will get back to you. I, we have this saying, it will bite you in the butt. If you do something that you really think is really good, but it's maybe not 100%, and then it will come back to you. Uh, and and bite you and you will face that problem mm -hmm. so uh, no i don't think so i think it's much better with to work with other tools and also prevention and, and start with the kids in school uh, mm -hmm. make, make make kids go to school and also talk about relationships talk about how to behave talk about i mean how to be a nice person to others and how to play with others without insulting without you know uh, hitting each other if you're angry i mean i think that because we must work with the children they are grow right. but they are taking over mm -hmm. uh, and if we don't work with them if we, mm -hmm. if we don't give them right values uh to work with then then they it will be the next perpetrator what is uh a prisoner's life like it, when they're incarcerated over in sweden because we obviously know what it's like over here but I mean, you know, they get three meals a day and they get health insurance and the education. And do they get all that over there as well? I think, I think if you compare the American system to the Swedish system, the Swedish system system is like going on a holiday. <laughs> really? Why? Yeah. Yeah. I think actually many of the of the foreign prisoners that we have to come from other countries and commit crimes in other countries, they actually want to go into prison because then they can have some they can they can work and get some salary and also edu they're not educated if they're not Swedish citizens, but they can have meals and, you know, be fed 
and then go back home to their home countries. Uh, but on the other hand, yeah, I, I am really divided in this. Uh, one, of, one part of me think that they should be treated the way they have treated others, you know, like, yeah, you know, revenge way of thinking. Mm -hmm. But the other way around, it won't be better for anyone. Mm -hmm. The victim is still a victim. The victim will still be has still been hurt. I mean, but we want these people to be better people when they go out because we don't have have, have life sentence in the way that they stay there for life. One day they will go out, and we want them to be kind of rehabilitated, you know, right. so, so a little better person than when they came. So, so even so, someone convicted of first degree murder, they're going to yeah. get out. They don't stay in for yeah. life if if they behave well if there is a prognosis that they can actually go out and, and behave uh but not everybody i think we have still we have some that actually are there for life but it's not for everyone so while we're getting ready to close this up for today what is your guys suggestion on how to like for kids that want to feel safer uh just for peace of mind that they can do to you know make them feel feel safer because now there's so many more kids home alone after school, they're going to school. They're not feeling safe there. Maybe they're going home into an abusive situation. They don't feel safe there. What can we do to help these kids? I think um, the model I become a big fan of is restorative justice. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole nother topic. Yes. Uh, but what I'm trying to get across with it is that there needs to be something else rather than just, uh, you know, you commit a crime, you're guilty, you go to jail, you're punished, mm -hmm. all right? And right now we have a system that's just perpetuating itself. And when you talk about kids in school, that's where a lot of it starts. Right. And right now there's been some success in the area with using restorative justice where the victim gets hurt and also the perpetrator has to come up with a plan to compensate, not necessarily by money, but to show faith that they're really sorry for what happened and get other people involved in it. And the key to that is what they've found in successful cases is the victim becomes more satisfied with the results mm -hmm. and the perpetrator is, is not ostracized. Right. And they're allowed back in the system. They have to make amends. So I think the system we have of just putting people away uh, is a failure. Mm -hmm. And I think we going back to what my friend just said, oh, what do you get? we have to look at it and do the work. Mm -hmm. What can the kids themselves do to give their own peace of mind right now with, until we can start acting better as adults and make this a safer place? To find a good friend <laughs> uh, or a good adult that they actually can talk to. I think that we need to talk about these problems. And I think, I mean, I also heard kids uh, in some of the of the suburbs of, of Stockholm, they also have this. They don't want to go out because they are afraid uh, and they, they see no future. They, and when one 10 year old boy, he said that if the teacher asked him what he sees in his future, where he would like to be. And he said, I don't know, I might get killed. I mean, if that is what a 10 year old boy say, then you realize how serious the problem is. Right. So right. I think that we really need to talk about it. We really need to see it. And mm -hmm. we also need, I mean, shout it out uh, because it's a huge problem. Right. And, and we will be a failed state uh, right. if we don't uh, deal with this. Right. So I think the kids, they must be with, with good friends, find good friends that, are, that actually give them some energy and also to find an adult that they can talk to. I think that is the, that is what they can do today. And, and building on that, yeah. I totally agree with it. And I can't think of a better place for people to be creating safety as uh, teachers. Hmm. Okay. Teachers are the role models for kids. Yeah. And if they are aware and understand these issues, uh, they can be great at intervention. Yeah. You know, I worked in a city where the school system was out of control and just pushed people out as fast as they could when they failed. And I learned, you know, when I had this big crime problem that this this problem was well on its way before it ever got to me. Right. And what I've learned even from raising kids is, uh, you know what? Having a kid graduate from high school who's well socialized 
is a lot more important than straight A's. And, uh, you know, that's to me is, I think the teachers could have a, you know, and obviously the parents, you know, can't escape it, but, mm. um, but having that safety valve in school would be a big thing. Mm. Absolutely. Well, I'm so glad, even though it was just three voices, but they all make a difference that you guys joined us today to be able to talk about it because in order to move forward, we got to take a step. So thank you so much. How can we find both of you? I know how we all find Ed, but people need to go out and read this book. It's fantastic. Please tell us where we can find you both. Uh, okay. My book is uh, called Just Policing, My Journey to Police Reform, where I talk about a lot of these things that were talked about today. And through my experience, how I feel um, it, there are other things that we can do that we're not doing. And also by working with my international colleagues, I've learned a lot from them. So uh, I have a website, www.justpolicing.org, and you can purchase it off my website. And the only official uh, place where you can find me is on LinkedIn, Ulrika Granberg, Ulrika with C, U-L-R-I-C-A, Granberg. Spell that. Yeah, I will try with the letters, G-R-R-A-B-E, no. G-R-A-N-B-E-R-G, -E would yes. be Granberg in yes. English. Yes. Okay. I would have messed that up. I'm so glad y'all did that for me. Thank you. No, uh, she she speaks incredible English. She you speaks know. amazing English. Yeah. She really yeah. does. And yeah. you have enlightened me so much. So, so much. Thank you so much again for taking time on your vacation to speak with us today. And Ed, it's always amazing to see you and have you on. And I love seeing your amazing he the pictures from Italy. That's my dream. And so while he was in Italy, I was being amputated. It's kind of fair trade. Just kidding. Yeah. And so she just, like, her, she just lost her hand. I did. I just lost um, my oh, hand and my arm. And so, oh, oh. yeah. So I literally was looking at his beautiful videos, you know, and our pictures. I'm sorry. Looking at his pictures. I was like, oh, I hope he's having the best time and his wife and him. They're so cute. So thank you so much as always, Ed. And I can't wait to be able to speak with you again. Thank you both for your time. I truly appreciate it. You're welcome. And let me know about that young boy. Of course. Thank you, guys. Have a great weekend.